Hi, everyone. How are you this evening? Um, I had introductory remarks that I was going to make, but I noticed, uh, to my surprise, my boss is here tonight, so I feel like I should probably say hello to the provost. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty nice. And for all of you who are freshmen and, and know the provost's music background, you also know he's a musician and has written a few songs. But I promise you that's not why he's okay. here, Jenny. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, just think about these following names. Bob Dylan, his catalog, the Bee Gees, Elton John, Carly Simon, Bruce Springsteen, Prince, Taylor Swift, Billie Eilish, Kendrick Lamar, Rosalita, Alicia Keys, Coldplay, Justin Bieber, and some names that I don't know, but Jody knows and probably most of the students know. What do all these names have in common? These are the artists brought into Universal Music Group who Jody personally knows, has signed, and has built a billion dollar global company, a brand around- Two billion. Two billion, I got the seat. <laughs> So please join me in an LMU and a CBA welcome to the chairman and CEO of Universal Music Publishing Group. Um, 30 years of incredible experience in this industry. Uh, this is Jody Gerson. I'd end up taking 10 or 15 minutes if I talked about all of the awards, but we want to really get right into it. And one of the first questions I wanted to ask her is how she got started in this business. Because something really odd happened. I was at home going through a box of photographs at my mother's house, and in the box was this picture of Diana Ross and the Supremes, and you're standing in the middle, and I think you were six or seven years old. It was your birthday party. Did you really think you were going to be in the music business from that point on? How did all that start? I mean, I think it's the only thing I knew. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and my father and my grandfather had a nightclub, kind of like think about like Las Vegas style nightclub. And um, in those days, it was, you know, artists performed there from Monday and two shows, Monday through Sunday, two shows on Sunday. So I grew up going to matinee shows uh, to have dinner with my father and my grandfather. And um, it was everyone from the Supremes to Richard Pryor to Frank Sinatra. I mean, you guys are all too young, but you, I hope, <laughs> know those names at least. And so I grew up watching the greatest entertainers of those, of those times. I grew up wandering around backstage, which was you know, had the perception of there was darkness, there was something weird, I didn't know what it was, but I, I had a really good sense of how entertainers, I watched them, I studied them. I knew I didn't want to be one. <laughs> you know, I took lots of guitar lessons. Um, and piano. Piano, mostly guitar, I thought I was like a cool girl. Um, you know, I'd be like <laughs> much more like, you know, Carly Simon or Carol King, but, I, um, I, I think that, that it's what I knew and it's what I loved and I loved music. And I grew up in a time in Philadelphia where um, there was a, a uh, producer's, it was called Philadelphia International Records. And I grew up just loving soul music and, and, and loving kind of the sound of Philadelphia. And I think, Honestly, it's what I knew, and and so when as I was growing up, I was very ambitious, shocking, um, and you know once I could, I did internships, and I worked two summers for a, a television show, and I worked one summer at a radio station, and when it was time to go to college, um, I went as far as way as far away as my father would send me. I really wanted to come to California. We came out to LA on a business trip. My father came out to see the agents in LA. And I was, we were at Beverly Hills, and I was like, oh, this is where <laughs> I am meant to be. Goodbye, Philadelphia. And I um, said to, and so I was applying to college, and I'm like, I want to go to college in California. And my father said, those people are crazy. You're not going to California. I'm like, how far away will you send me? And I don't know, randomly he said Chicago, so yeah. I went to Northwestern. By the way, couldn't get into Northwestern today, just want to say, <laughs> for the record, I, did, I had a great interview, and I went to Northwestern. Um, 
And I think that, you know, when I worked on the college concert board, the A&O board, and I, I just always, I wanted to work. I mm -hmm. wanted to have a career. And mm -hmm. so I think that's where it began. But that was really different. I mean, you didn't grow up with your mom working and your dad was in the business. No, here's the role big reveal. Here's the, the <laughs> <laughs> my father was my, I thought my father was my role model. Mm -hmm. um, my father was Bigger than, bigger than life, you remember, bigger than life personality, you know, was the king of Philadelphia. People calling the house all the time for tickets to shows. And my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And I was never going to be dependent on anybody else. And I, 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 I my mother doesn't like when I tell this story, but when I was a sophomore in college, my father um, bounced my tuition check. And it was shocking. And I thought, these things don't happen to a girl like me. But you know what? They do. And it was, and I tell my children today, you, you have to have something to overcome to be extraordinary. And for me, that was the pivotal moment. It took a long time for me to be able to talk about it. But the fact is, I had to figure it out. I got all of my classes, you know, they, they, they you know, um, I didn't, you know, they were like, you know, you're out of all those classes. I had to go to each professor. Once I figured out what I was going to do, I had to go to each professor and get in the classes again. Mm -hmm. And I got a job in Chicago at a clothing store, and I figured it out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was that moment that I kind of knew my whole life that I was the grown-up in the house, and I kind of knew that I had to take care of things. But that solidified it, and I don't know that I knew that then, but I know it now. Yeah. How has that changed in terms of the way you interact? You have three children. I have three children. Uh, two finished college. So I have one and finished one college. Yeah, Julian went to, Julian's 29. He went to NYU, and he is an executive at Columbia Records. Luke, um, my middle son, is a junior at mm -hmm. NYU. They both, both of them went to, he goes to Gallatin, where also Julian went to. And I have a daughter who is 19 and a freshman at University of Miami. Yeah. Are they looking? Uh, two of them are in the music industry. Well, one's in the music so, industry. So the other's Julian gone. Julian is in the music industry. Luke um, was a producer and was, you know, I, Julian also produced and wrote songs. Um, and I think for Julian, it was a way to, it, my kids didn't have that thing of being, kind of in studio and kind of grinding it out. And I think once Julian, my older one, realized he wasn't Jeff Basker, he always talks about Jeff Basker is a big producer who produced Kanye and a lot of people. And he was like, once he realized he wasn't going to be the best, in the same way that when my both boys realized they weren't going to be pro basketball players, they stopped playing. <laughs> um, but I think it was the same thing in music for yeah. Julian. But it serves him because he understands how, he understands the process. And mm -hmm. I think... Luke, who I who was very successful in producing, I thought he was he you know he went to NYU, and said to me, oh, you know I'm going to last a year because I'm going to be a big producer, and he discovered education, mm -hmm. and he discovered how much he likes to read, and he connected with a professor there, who he loves, and his life has changed and. He might end up going to law school. I don't know. Um, and Daisy doesn't care about music. <laughs> so when you talk about that pivotal moment at Northwestern, have there been other transformational points in your life? I mean, you've had this amazing career um, at EMI and then Sony and then the, the, the big position to Universal Music, and you've sort of climbed that ladder. Mm -hmm. Were there transformational moments where you just knew you were going to go right to the top of the music industry like this? No. I... Well, yes, one in particular, but I think as I was, remember, I didn't grow up in a family that worked at companies. I, you know, my dad had businesses and, and you know, I, I didn't know any, my parents didn't even go to college. I mean, my mom went like a semester until she got engaged, but they, I didn't come from that kind of family. Mm -hmm. And, and for me, Working at a company, you know, when I graduated from school and was interviewing for jobs, it never occurred to me, because of my background, I was never going to start my own company. I, 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 
And again, it's something I didn't know then, but I know now, but there was something about a comfort, you know, when your life is kind of um, not, not, not kind of secure financially, mm -hmm. or it was, and then the bottom falls, and you see your mom not having any power. Um, I think all of those things formed mm -hmm. who, who I am and what my choices were. And um, when I graduated from school, I knew I wanted to be in the music business. I moved to New York, mm -hmm. because again, no one would send me to California. Um, <laughs> I got here as soon as a company would send me. But I, I went to New York and I interviewed and I thought, okay, what are my skills? I have a great personality. I love music. I could sell anything. And so I went around to record companies. And it, in, in, in those days, there weren't high-level women. There weren't high-powered or, or, or women in the music business that were running anything. Women were in promotion. Women were in publicity. They just were. And some women were in music publishing. I didn't know what music publishing was. But when I went around to the labels, I thought, ew, I, I'm not going around to record companies, uh, rec uh, to radio stations, promoting music. I'm not doing that. I don't want to be a publicist. What am I going to do? And I randomly, I, I just met people. I met tons of people. I networked. I went to every event possible. And then, because those days, you guys, you couldn't just text someone. You actually had to meet them and then send a follow-up uh, letter um, about how nice it was to meet them. To, I, would, I would do anything to make an impression. And um, Chapel Music, there was a job at Chapel Music. And I was starting to, like, what, what am I going to do? And I went into Chapel Music. I had no idea what it was. Um, and I took a job there, and it was music publishing. And it truly ended up being the perfect career for me. And at Chapel, I took a job um, in the, uh, oh, the job was I Xeroxed lead sheets, and, le and I typed up lyric sheets. And, but I used it as an opportunity. So when the Broadway writers in New York needed lyric sheets or lead sheets, instead of sending a messenger for them, I would go do it. I'd play a game with myself, like beat the messenger. How fast could I get there? Mm -hmm. And I would, that way I could maybe meet someone. And so I did all of those things. And then, you know, I got, um, there was the person left who was in the tape room and I combined jobs, didn't get a raise, but combined, I didn't care. I just wanted, you know, I lived in New York with, a roommate, and we put a wall up in like a studio <laughs> apartment, and we did what we had to do. But it really ended up, luckily, being the right place for me. And I think I just took every opportunity to make some happen. But you said like, what was the thing? So I'm like going along at chapel. I start pitching songs out of the tape room. I start having success. I say to my boss, I want to be promoted. He was like, well, you're doing fine in the tape room pitching song. <laughs> and I said, but I want an office. <laughs> and he said, you don't need an office. Nobody's going to know you for your office. They're going to know you for the songs and the artists that you bring them. I mean, to this day, I have such a good office. <laughs> because he was like, didn't want to give me an office. So, so every step in, in my career, there was an obstacle, Dale. Right. There was always an obstacle. And I always had to figure out how to manage that obstacle. Mm -hmm. And most of those obstacles were bosses and coworkers. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, when I was at chapel, there was one woman, I've told this story before, and she was the head of sync at chapel. Head of? Sync, synchronization, which is when you... You pitch songs for film and tell just yeah. not everybody knows yeah, all so, of this so, stuff, right? This is new information. Okay. So the point is, she was like this. You know, I thought she was really, you know, very important. She ran a department, and I walked in her office and I said, "Can, can, um, can we talk? What?" And I said, <laughs> "Well, you know, I I could use your advice, and I could." I mean, in those days, you would never say, you would never assume someone would be your mentor. You didn't have mentors. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like that. But I said, would you give me advice? And mm -hmm. she said, no. You're going to have to find your way like I did. But it was generational, Dale. Right. What, in those days in the music business, one woman's position was a position she was holding yeah. on to. But you're not like that. 
No, no. I, <laughs> I was going to say, I know like that. that. I am About not you. like that. But I think a lot of the things that I learned along the way and the way I am as a leader is because of the things that those obstacles and those kind of walls that people tried mm -hmm. to put up to prevent me from being successful. But I, I um, you know, you I let it stop you. I still don't let it stop me. But you're a different kind of leader. So what, what, what's a day in the life like now that you're in the C-suite running this thing? So, you know, I think that I, so the, the, I took this job at Universal, and I laugh when I say it's a $2 billion company. It's something I'm very proud of, because when I, I left Sony because I wasn't going to be my boss's successor, and he told me, I, even though his boss told me I was going to be, he said I wasn't going to be. And I thought, oh, I, I, I have to leave. And I called, um, had my lawyer, and I called Lucy and Grange, who's the chairman of Universal Music Group. And I said, you know, let's ask him if there's an opportunity for me there. And I went to his house, and he said, do you want to be the chairman of Universal Music Publishing? And I said, yes, <laughs> but out of spite for my boss, you know, my, my boss. I'm like, yes. So success is the best form of I revenge. I mean, it's unbelievable. And having that conversation with him where he said, you know, I've decided I am leaving. What, what, what will you be doing, Jody? Will you be producing movies? No, Marty. I'm going to be the chairman of Universal Music Publishing. And he said, but that's my job. I said, I know. <laughs> um, but, but I took the job not knowing that I could do it. Mm -hmm. I knew... My whole career, when all these guys were getting promoted, I was wondering why, why, why wasn't I getting those jobs? And I used, you know, people would be like, "Oh, you're so loyal to your." I was so loyal to any boss that I ever worked for because I, I did think that loyalty and doing good work was gonna get me there. But I wasn't offered the same jobs that guys were getting. I just wasn't. So, so when Lucien offered me this job, every bit of insecurity was like. You can't do it. You still, I was divorced. I had three kids. I think two of them were still at home. Um, but I took it. Mm -hmm. And I took the company then, which was an 800, 800, 800 million dollar company. And nine years later, we're a $2 billion revenue business. Mm. And I am really proud of that because at some point it had to stop being about being the first female chairman of a music company. And I want to be judged by the success mm -hmm. and the numbers and my EBITDA and the things that people ask men about who run companies. Not about how did I raise three kids and do this. Mm -hmm. And I did raise three kids on my own and did this. And my kids are thriving and they're great. Mm -hmm. But I took this job as me. Mm -hmm. I didn't take this job to emulate any boss that I had before me. And you've really done some different things. Maybe, uh, you know, walk us through. You didn't go to business, oh. you didn't go to business school. I didn't. But, you know, I didn't. This is what I have. I have really good instincts. And I am secure enough to know what I don't know. And it's interesting, because when I took this job, I went to my really good friend, who's now chairman of, of Capitol Records. And I said, hey, Michelle, how am I going to do this? And Because I said to Lucian, oh, this is what Lucian said to me, OK, here's the deal. You're so well liked. Artists love you. People love you. When you take this job, people aren't going to like you. Mm. I thought, that's <laughs> not true. Because people want to know where they stand. People want the truth. And people like you for telling the truth. Even if, And you have to learn how to give bad news. I'm really good at giving bad news. But <laughs> I, said to Mich I, I said to Lucy when I took the job, I said, no, no, no. If you want to hire me, then, then let me continue to do the things I'm good at. Let me find someone else to do those the, the other job, the job that that the job that is more detail oriented, the job that 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 is you know I have to be forward facing. 
So my friend, I said to Michelle, I don't know anybody who could be my number two. And she said, there's this guy. He's so great, Mark Cimino. He's He was the head of business affairs at Warner Brothers Records. He was the general manager there. You're going to love him. And Mark and I went out and we met for breakfast. And it was like, this is the person. He, he was the person. And... I am successful because I have an incredible team. So Mark is my C, and, and what we've done is, you know, Mark is, he always says to me, why are you giving that person bad news? I'm like, I just wanted it off my desk. I just want to tell him. He goes, no, 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 no. You give good news, let me give bad news. Mm -hmm. And we have an amazing, and people really like him. By the way, he brought in the Bob Dylan deal. I didn't bring in the Bob Dylan deal. Mark brought that mm -hmm. in. Mark got to sign yeah, as the COO all of his favorite artists mm -hmm. because people really like him. But but we 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 kind of the way the world goes. My direct reports are Mark, my CFO, who is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Really important when you're running a business to have a CFO that you trust. And you know, my head of business affairs, David Kokakis, is extraordinary. My A and R people are great. But what what Mark and I do is we kind of. My, so my direct reports are my CFO, my COO, the president of the company, um, the head of the UK, the head of France, because we were a French-owned company, so that was kind of important. Um, and I think I have a couple other. And Mark takes the rest of the world. And I am good with that. And we have amazing mm -hmm. communication, and it's great. And my CFO has a different skill set. So when Mark says, when Mark and I talk about a deal, I ask JW other questions. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are the projections? Is the margin going to kill us? Is the does the deal work? Mm -hmm. and, and while we all have a love of music, we all have a different skill set. Mm -hmm. And so I think my success is due to the, what do we have, 700 people around the world now? Almost 900? Yeah. I mean, we have an extraordinary group of people. And you know what else? We have a no asshole rule. <laughs> okay. We do. Do I'm tell. Kidding. I'm not kidding. Yeah. We don't. We have a gorgeous group of people who like each other. I was, you know, we, we um, you know, all the stuff you hear about the music business and it being cutthroat. I've been able to create a company that operates with the highest level of integrity. Mm -hmm. You know, when I came to Universal, and you, you, you hear so much about the music business as being really hard on people, and, and, and for sure at record companies, different than publishing companies, there's a lack of transparency. But when I came to Universal, my predecessor, to his credit, had invested in technology. And so when I got there, you know, there had been a company called Cobalt that prided itself on being a tech company. We were a publishing company. They were a tech company. And I would talk with my team, should we be a tech company? Is that mm -hmm. what people want? And we decided not to be a tech company. But what we decided to do was amplify the tech that we had. Mm -hmm. And we created an app, and we created all kinds of opportunities for our writers and their representatives to go on the app and to look on the, the website, on our, our a global app and site, and see where they were earning money and what the deals, like full transparency. Mm -hmm. The other thing we did was, was we had a mechanism and if you needed money, if you're a writer mm -hmm. who wanted an advance on your royalties, you'd hit a box. And we didn't know who would be asking for money early. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't charge for it. I didn't charge any interest for it. And what we found out, it was people who needed the money. Mm -hmm. So if there was money in their account, they could see it. They could ask for $10,000. And we did it. And I'm really proud of that. And I'm really proud that there are no secrets. I grew up at a time in the music business where we had all the information. We knew what was in the pipeline on a deal. And, and the other side didn't. And there were so many opportunities for a gotcha. There are no mm -hmm. gotchas at our company. And the last thing I'm going to say about that is we had a global conference. Um, we, every summer, I have each one of our global leaders host in their territory. So this year, we went to Berlin. And we did this kind of 
thing with H with people inclusion and culture, formerly known as HR, and about uh, our values. And the company Universal Music Group had chosen five or six values, and each division gets to choose their own value. And when we had the conversation, I said, oh, ours, how is integrity not on that list? And she said, well, integrity could be yours. I said, well, I want integrity to be mine. And then I thought, mm, let me go out to my, my teams mm -hmm. and see what they say. And they said integrity. Mm -hmm. So I'm really proud about that. And I think that's something that that is unlike any company that ever worked for before. And we get a lot of business because of it. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that and kind of in, into that business and that notion of the value of integrity and what it means to be an ethical business leader mm -hmm. in this. You're in an industry where when we read the press, we read about the fights between artists and the people who are paying them for their work and royalties. There's issues around AI mm -hmm. and we've just come through writer's strikes right here in this town mm -hmm. because there's a real sense of a, a lack of security around that. How are you all wrestling with those issues and how do you see those as the big issues that impact the industry and staying true to your values and, and your belief in people and the kind of company you want to build and the relationships with your artists? So a big part of my job is to make sure that music has value. That's a big part of my job. And music is, is an economy. It's an economy for people. They should be able to get paid for their work. So a huge part is, is, is songwriter advocacy. And making, you know, we're we're at a time where there every day there's some new company that that is is basing their business on music. And in terms of AI, I think we have to embrace it. Mm -hmm. It's here to stay. The question is, is there responsible AI? We we've started kind of a a thing called human artistry. And I think if AI is trained on human artistry, we have to figure out how to compensate human beings for their art. Um, I think that there are, look, people use AI all the mm -hmm. time. So I think if there are AI tools that enhance the creative process, great. Is it scary today that AI you know, could replace an artist? I don't know, do you guys connect as fans with artists? Can you connect in the same way with a song that was created? I don't know, and maybe as it gets better, I, I, maybe, I think we have to be open to the possibilities, but make sure mm -hmm. that human beings get paid for their work. So I think that's a big part. Um, you know, we're currently looking at, you know, I don't know, it, it's in the weeds, but you know, we're looking at TikTok. What am I going to do about TikTok? <laughs> uh, no, on every level. And and right now, where our deal with TikTok is up, we have to renegotiate a new deal. And the things that I have to think about are they do not value music. They say that music isn't important, but how many of you guys, you know, hear music on TikTok? A lot. <laughs> um, you know, but the other thing is, and really making sure, it's not about putting money in mm -hmm. my pocket or the company's pocket. It's making sure that songwriters can 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 live their lives creating that art. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing on TikTok is, and I, I look, it's a great promotional tool. It's a quick fix if you have it uh, if you have a hit. But is it really a good idea that kids, that even you guys? Are responding to 15 seconds of a song, a sound. It's sometimes not even the hook of the song. I don't know if that's a good thing. That being said, I have to embrace it. It is what it is. People, I remember listening to early, um, like hip hop with my kids and going, and it, the song would come on and Julian would be like, oh, it's terrible. I'm like, you haven't even gotten to the verse. What do you mean? <laughs> And how music changes, and it's my job to be, to be. I used to be of the culture. Now I'm. At, uh, now I study the culture. But how does that? I mean, how does that work? You, you know, all of these new musicians are trying to get heard. They they're trying to get played. Uh, 
writers, there, I'm sure there are a bunch of students here in the audience tonight who have dabbled in songwriting. How does that get to you and how does that get into the hands of the artist? What's that process like? <clears throat> so very different. <clears throat> when I first started on the business, you would get a cassette or a demo or whatever. Things have changed, which is, you know, there's so much um, opportunity for you to get music out there with that. There's no barrier to entry. I did something, I did a, a Q and A with Barry Gibb from the Bee Gees when in our last conference. And he was saying, and I said, oh my God, you were writing during a time where the Beatles were creating music and Dylan and all these amazing people. Were you competitive with those other artists? He said, yeah, I was competitive. But he also said, I wanted to impress my manager and my record company. It's so different now because in those days, you needed that. You needed a record company to have success. Mm -hmm. Today, there's so many ways you can do it on your own. And then, and I'm not saying that it's not important to have a record company, but it all depends on what your ambition is. It's not that hard, Dale, to get attention, mm -hmm. it's hard to have a career. Okay. It is. And I think some of that is not just talent, you guys. It's ambition. How much are you willing to do? I knew that I did not have what it took to be in front of a stage. And, 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 and I think there are, you know, like during the pandemic, tons of like TikTok artists got record deals. Do you know the percentage that actually went on to have careers? <laughs> very, that's right, very, very small. But it doesn't mean that that's not an opportunity. Listen, I, I was at, at someone's house with me and there was a, um, who's that guy who works for um, Elliot, the, um, Alice's best friend, Octopus? Uh, oh, yeah, Octopus, okay. He was there and my boss said to me, you know, you kids would know who he was. I'm like, I know who he is. And he was like, he's making millions of dollars. There's lots of way to make millions of dollars. There are today. It's so weird. But for me, what, what, wake, what gets me up every morning is, am I going to hear something, music, that moves me? Mm. It still comes down to that. I talk about value. I'm an advocate. But really, at the end of the day, I do this because I never know when I'm gonna be introduced to an artist that makes me feel something. I was in Nashville last week, and my office, which is so amazing. You guys, if any of you who are in music, you need to go to Nashville. Mm -hmm. A couple reasons why. Everybody, like here, you know, you go to a restaurant and the waiter or the waitress wants to be an actor. Everybody there wants to be in the music business. But it's that they all root for each other. They all are so happy for each other. One person's success is everybody's success. But we had a showcase at our office, and there was this band called the band Lula, L-O-U-L-A. They're from Georgia. Two best friends. And I was like, oh my God, I love this so much. And that is what thrills me. Yeah. So I think I wandered in that. answering that question. No, it's okay. Mm. You know, it, it, it's interesting. You talked a little bit about advocacy for artists, that that's so integral to who you are as a music executive. Mm -hmm. um, you started a group. You co-founded and sit on the board of directors of She Is The Music. Mm -hmm. When you read the mission statement for She Is The Music, you, I mean, talk about feeling something. I'm getting chills even thinking about it. You. Could you share a little bit more about why She Is The Music? I mean, because you started off by saying, I want to be known as an executive for what I can do and how I get my company to $2 billion and the team I work with, and it shouldn't be about, and I did that while I had three kids or I was female. Yeah. And yet, this is a group that you're very passionate about. I am. So... During the whole Me Too, Time's Up thing, <clears throat> I have a lot of friends who um, are in the film and TV business, a lot of friends who are agents. Very few of my friends are in the music business. I have more friends now in the music business than I did then. But, um, so I went to some early Time's Up meetings, and I thought, this doesn't ring true to my business. It's not. It was very much about taking men down. I like men a lot. Um, 
And I, no, and, and I run a meritocracy, I do. But I thought something, ha and then the Grammys, just the numbers were horrible that year for women. And I thought, well, what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. And so we, I went to Alicia Keys, who I had originally signed when she was 14 years old. And I mean, to have a an adult relationship with someone who you signed when they were a kid is just really amazing. And by the way, she's a show that's going on Broadway called Hell's Kitchen that is so good that uses her music that I just saw last week. So um, I went to Alicia and I said, what, what should we do about this? And we created this foundation with a very simple message. Mm -hmm. It's about if you bring one woman along, there's one more opportunity for a, a woman. So it's not, it's not, um, you know, and I think as we've, you know, we have mentorship programs and we do all kinds of things, but I, I think what I, I've come to, mm -hmm is that, and this is a generalization, I'm so scared to speak at college campuses like that I'm gonna say something wrong. So <laughs> forgive me it, the way I, I say this. Um, guys grow up playing on teams. They're much more oriented to play a, a role together in a team. And when a guy, there's so many differences of how I grew up versus the guys who I work with grow up. And I'll talk about my generation, just maybe it's just safer that way. Um, and, 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 and I think girls, you know, there's a thing about perfection. There's a thing about, you know, um, you know, I went to an all girls school and I always talk this story, like it was so good. I went to an all girls school and I went to all girls summer camp and I, it was so good to be around girls, but it really, is, it, was, it was competitive. It was competitive and, you know, I, I can tell you very clearly who the top 10 smartest girls in my class were and it wasn't me. And I knew I had other things, but not, I, I was never gonna be that straight A student who was going to Harvard. But I, I realized that what it's going to take for us women to be successful is sisterhood. In the same way guys, can sit together and watch a game. You know, like when I was coming up, and even now, you know, we have basketball tickets. No one ever asked me, you know, no other the guys asked me to sit with them at the basketball game. You know, I don't want to anyway. But there was <laughs> many years that I was like, wait, no one's asking me to play golf. Nobody's play, asking me to go to games. But they sit next to each other. And they don't, you know, sometimes business comes through or the guys invite other guys to dinner parties and they offer each other deals and opportunities. And a lot of work gets done for them outside of work and they have community and they don't have to be friends. They don't have to be friends to throw each other business opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I kind of look at that and went, all right, I have to really like women who are transactional I can't put them down and I have to want all of us to be successful. My success has to be, people have to stop describing me as the first. If I'm the first, all right, let me be the first. I can't be the only. Mm -hmm. And it's not gonna be, and I grew up thinking that my boss, the person I was so loyal to and did such a good job for, was gonna pat me on the shoulder and say, you know what, it's your turn. It doesn't happen that way. It just doesn't. And so She Is the Music came about initially about creating opportunity, and now I think it's about sisterhood. And I really do believe that we will only be successful, as successful as we wanna be, if we want each other to be successful, we create space for each other. And here's the other thing. We tell our stories. Mm. Our stories are really important. Telling my story of all the times that I was like, well, it wasn't, it wasn't about sexual harassment for me. It wasn't that. It was about being underestimated. Mm. It was about feeling insecure about being ambitious. I was like ashamed of being ambitious. I didn't want, you know, I wanted, you know, I, I read something, I don't know if you guys ever read Adam Grant. Mm. 
And Adam Grant said he's a sociolo so, so, sociologist, and he said he wrote some piece about how if women use a I forget what word it was. You guys would know you're an academic. I don't know. It's like a quiet voice to get a raise. If women go to their boss and go, you know what I was thinking? It'd be really good for you if you gave me a raise. <laughs> I'm, She'll I'm get her. I'm getting eyes from my boss right now, just letting you know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. If she says, it's, if she says, you know what, it'll be really good for you, she's going to get it. If she says, I demand a raise, not necessarily going to get it. If a guy says, you know, I was thinking, really would be good if you gave me a raise, he's not getting it. If he says, I demand a raise, he gets it. And I wrote a note to Adam, and I said, I just want you to know how far I've gotten using that little voice. <laughs> but I know you have to know your audience. You have to know who you're talking to and what they're thinking and sit in their shoes. And I know a lot of you women today and people today think you're entitled to something. And you think everything is an issue. Mm. Everything. I cannot tell you how many issues I've had. And if I stopped at every issue and made a big thing, I would not be sitting where I am. And I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just what worked for me. Yeah. I'm a little bit cognizant of time, and I'm guessing that there are probably some folks in the audience who probably have questions of you. Um, I had 20 more questions. This has been a wonder. No, no. This was a wonderful conversation, and I just wanted to share that. Um, let's open up the conversation. Uh, I've got so much I could continue to ask you about, but we'll have to do that in another time. Um, questions from the audience? Just raise your hand, and I think we've got a roving mic. We do. Jackie's got the roving mic there. Got someone down here? Hi. Is this on? Okay. It is. Um, I guess as faculty, I'll, I'll get the students warmed up. My name is Vanessa Diaz. I'm faculty in Chicano and Latino Studies here. Thank you so much for this. This is amazing. Um, so I teach a class called Bad Bunny and Resistance in Puerto Rico here at LMU. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> does, he know, does he know that? He knows about it. He talked right. about it on Jimmy Fallon two weeks ago, and he's talked about it in other outlets. So um, I have a two-part question for you. Um, Obviously, as someone who's working on multiple uh, projects about Latin music, Universal has been so hugely important for Latin music. So I was wondering if you could share any kind of reflections or, or thoughts on this current moment in just massive American and global interest and success for music in Spanish and Latin music more broadly. And then the other thing is I know Bad Bunny's credited as, as one of your artists, and obviously I'm, I've worked with folks at um, Rimas and The Orchard, so I know he does publishing with them as well. So I'm curious kind of what that the relationship with Universal looks like and how you navigate working with artists who are dealing with multiple publishing houses. So just to answer your second question, so Remus is his publisher. We administer Remus, so that's why. So we do all of the global collection and licensing and, and stuff like that. So that, that's that. So, you know, I think there are two areas that are showing tremendous growth and tremendous opportunity. One is country, which is now traveling. The other is Latin music and Spanish-speaking music. And I think, you know, we have offices all over the world. And I'm very proud, and by the way, my head of uh, Latin music is a woman, in, by the way, such a tough business, um, who's doing incredibly well. But I, I'm really happy to see and to, to you know, I think the, um, uh, um, the whole regional Mexican is amazing. I'll tell you a story. So um, my, um, my head of Mexico signed Corinne Leon. And Corinne Leon said, you know, he signed us for less money because what he really wanted was to write with country artists. And um, the woman who runs my, my office in Mexico called our Nashville office, and they were like, we'll see. I, we can't promise anything. So Corinne goes to Nashville, and he sells out Bridgestone Arena. Sells out. And they were like, oh, how, we we're going to get him some collaborations. And he started working with people. This guy, John Party, who's from Texas. And 
killed it. And it was so successful that we had a writing camp in Mexico City where we brought writers from Nashville to Mexico City. And it's so, I think it is, there is enormous potential. I think it's a funny time that kids are listening to Bad Bunny, for instance, and there's a language barrier. And even if you understand Spanish, you have no idea what he's saying. <laughs> I mean, like literally, it's so hard. It really is, but it's become cultural. There's a cultural phenomenon. We signed another artist named um, Yaritza Isuasencia, and she's a young girl. Um, her songwriting is extraordinary. She gets signed to Columbia Records. She she lives, she, 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 you know, I think the families, migrant workers, kids are first generation, some of the kids are first generation, gets this record deal, gets this publishing deal, and her brother gets deported. Her brother gets deported. And he ends up in Mexico City where we took a lot of our people took care of him and we hired lawyers and you know, first. They reject, I mean, it was a drag. So I think there's so much happening and I think it's it's a very interesting time and it's a very exciting time. By the way, he's he's home, He's they're touring. But to see the level of excitement on a global basis and then you take an artist like Rosalia, who I work with intimately from Spain and she's doing things women don't do. She's producing, she's writing. It's so I think it's changing, and I think it's really exciting. And for me, um, I have offices in every major territory throughout the world, so I let them sign, and then we support globally. And, and I will also say, to see these executives in Mexico shine now and have confidence and realize they're playing in the global market now. Mm -hmm. They're not a second class citizen is tremendously, it just gives me pride. It's just fantastic. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So, and I think we're gonna see more. You know, it's like every, every Anglo label wants to sign a Spanish speaking artist. I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's so many questions. Jackie, I'm going to let you go back and forth. <laughs> First off, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Your words really mean a lot. Thank um, you. So my question is, um, as a new artist, what's the biggest piece of advice for launching music for the first time? Don't be afraid to put it out there. You have to put it out there. It's not doing anything sitting in your computer. Introduce your music to your friends. Just see what happens. Nothing bad, here's the beauty of right now how music is released. If nobody likes it, nobody's gonna ever know about it. And who cares? Keep putting it out there and don't be afraid. But the big advice I have for you is you cannot have a plan B. That's my big trick. That's, that's my big trick question when people come in and if I see any kind of doubt, I'm like, what would you be doing if you're not, if if this doesn't pan out for you? And if they give me an answer, they don't have what it takes. And I mean that with a big heart of somebody who cares about someone. It is a really hard job on every level. Um, you know, being on the road. It's not. It takes. I mean, you guys look at Taylor Swift. Thank God she has private planes, because, I mean, how she got off that plane from Argentina, she looked so gorgeous, didn't she? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't happen that way. I mean, she looks stunning. How is she not so tired? I'm sure that bed was made on the plane. Like, she had a full night's sleep, no problem. But it, what it takes, I mean, I could do a whole thing on Taylor Swift for you, because there's no one like her. I mean, the ambition and the the work ethic is unlike anybody else, unlike anybody else. Um, and running a business like a proper CEO, not like anybody else. But even to just get started, you, you can't be afraid. You just gotta put it out there. And that's, and just keep doing it. Does that, is that, does that make sense to you? It does, thank you so much. You're welcome.
Hi, Ms. Garrison. Hi. I uh, really appreciate hearing some of your insights as an industry insider. Uh, so our group, we're actually working on a project right now, and we chose a brand to kind of fix an issue for, so we chose Spotify. Mm -hmm. And among the changes that you talked about uh, within the music industry with AI and such, um, I think streaming service is definitely one of them has disrupted the industry. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on the rising issue of artist pay for streaming services like Spotify, Apple Music, and whatnot, um, and how you think these streaming services should address these, and maybe some ways that artists could as well. So I think we're starting to address it <coughs> with artist-centric, because I think the, the you know, part of the problem is there's so much noise, you know, and, and I think, you know, I think they're starting to address it. Can I ask you a question? What is Go the problem it. that you guys want it, we're, we're, are fixing at Spotify? What, what did you identify as the problem at Spotify? So there was a couple things. At first, we wanted to talk about like maybe some of the controversies they've had. But then we decided that a better thing to address would be the artist compensation that has been kind of vocalized by artists. So right now, I think artists are earning somewhere between like a 30th to a 50th of a cent per stream, which, you know, if you're Drake, probably not a big deal. But we were trying to find ways, which we've outlined, we have like an idea, but mm -hmm. I wanted to hear it from someone. You know, look, I think the drag is that you can make a living. I mean, you need, you need lots of streams. You really do. So on, on one side, when you think about the days in which people bought physical product, right? You would buy that album or cassette or whatever it is for $10. No matter how many times you played that, no matter how many times, it was only ever going to be worth $10. The thing about streaming is every time a song is played, even though you make like a fraction of a, of a cent, you have an opportunity of making more. The issue is, I think some of the issue is there's so much noise. And I remember when I first, when when Spotify first came out, and you know, Daniel like would come to the office, more, more, we need more. And Apple's like, we need more, we need more. I don't know that more is better. I don't know that more is better. I think. You know, when you listen to, I don't know if you guys listen to New Music Friday. I do just to get updated. I'm like, ugh, 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 ugh. <laughs> because, because how much, you know, not all music is great. It's just not. It, and especially now, it's just not. You know, it, it takes years between an, before an artist gets great. And now it's like one song and you have a big hit and then like, you know. But how do you develop a family? So I think that you're the 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 bottom rung, not going to make a living on Spotify in the music business, and it's just not going to happen. And the middle class. So I think about songwriters. It 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 used to be that songwriters who wrote album cuts, right, songs that just sat on an album could make money because if the if Mariah Carey's album sold you know ten million records everybody on that album got paid the same amount. If you're not listening to a song, nobody, it's, you're not getting paid. So I don't know if I answered the question. I think that the, compen the, it, the compensation is not bad. It's better than it's been. It's kind of up to the artist to create their own value in a way. I think it's up to the artist and their team. I think it's about songs that resonate and artists that resonate. Some of it, and I think we overuse the word culture, it's getting like, you know, not everybody can relate. What is cult, like, why is somebody, like, oh, they're in the culture. I don't even know what that means anymore, honestly. No, I don't, because I think we've gotten so, we've gotten so into data. Data, data, what's the data say? I don't know, it's great that there's data, but if I don't love it, I don't care what the data says. But I, I, I think that it's, the world has changed. People are not gravitating. Listen, do, do you think that, here's a question. Do you think that kids 
who are discovering songs on TikTok are then going to Spotify and listening to the artist? That's the question. How do we get people to, they're, they're not, right? I know, I know, I know. How do we fix it? <laughs> I think it's about fan engagement. Yeah. I think it might be about um, creating more opportunities for top tier artists to, and I, maybe it's charging more money, you know, just for more fan engagement. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know yet. I think some of it is how kids listen to music. Thank you so much. Appreciate I don't know it. if I answered it because we we also arrived at the similar kind of yeah. we we have an idea, but okay. I wanted to hear your. You're insight. certainly right. seeing the intersection though of business and art, right? In other words, fan engagement and branding and all of that makes a small amount volume, right? Yeah. Got some more folks in the back here, and then you've got somebody up there, Jack. Mm. Hello, my name is Katrina Lau, senior marketing student here. First of all, I'd love to say I love your outfit. Thank you. <laughs> and then I wanted to talk about like the business side of the music industry. So among your successful teams, what skills or attributes do you see commonly within those teams that would be helpful for people who are interested in, within the music industry? It depends on where you want to be. <clears throat> what I say is like everyone who works at Universal should love music and everybody has an opportunity to touch it whether you're in copyright or royalties or whether if you have if what you really want to do is be an a and r you just have to like i started out in a and r i just had a sense that what i liked would be popular it's just a sense of it um and then i had to learn deal structure you know basics but i think i think it's about finding an area in the business that you love, and then just knowing what, what, you know, it's like getting a foot in the door and figuring it out. It doesn't always have to be the one thing. And when you guys are ready to get jobs, take a job. Don't wait for the one special thing. Figure, you know, so I don't know, like, what do you love? I want to do, like, the product side, uh -huh. of product marketing side of, like, the music industry. There's lots of opportunity for it in the music business and in independent companies. It seems to be like the hot thing right now. I do know that a lot of people have some seven o'clock classes and it's not rude if you need to leave. Um, I know Jody's willing to stay for another 10 yeah, minutes or sure. so to continue sure. to answer questions. But if you do need to leave for class, it's totally cool to do that. Your professors await. Um, next question. Hi, um, my name is Asal. First of all, I wanted to thank you for coming here and sharing all of this insight with us. It's truly valuable because, as you know, the music industry has a lot of gatekeepers and people like you definitely help us a lot. It's invaluable. Thank you. Um, so I'm involved in the PR um, with independent artists and stuff like that. And what I find very hard is to like choose people that I want to work with. Like There are tons of independent artists in LA, especially because it's one of the biggest cities when it comes to music. So I just wanted to see um, what do you see in an artist? Because I know like there are millions of artists that get signed by labels on a yearly basis, but many of them get shelved. So what do you see in an artist that you're like, okay, we're not gonna shelf this artist and we're gonna put all of our resources that we have in this label to make this artist the biggest artist in the world, the next big artist in the world. So what is that one thing that you're looking for in artists when you sign them? Um, there are a couple things. But I think, you know, one of the big things is what they're willing to do. And, and you know, there's a real difference between an artist who puts out one song and then becomes an influencer, which happens a lot and other people who really work on their craft and tour and go on the road. Here's my big advice on this. You can't want it for an artist more than they want it for themselves. Whenever I've made a mistake, and I made a few, it's because I saw something in an artist that they didn't see in themselves. And if I want it more for them than they want it for themselves, it's not going to happen. They have to want it. And sometimes it's not about having the best song. It's about just 
you know, I, I think it's a combination of things, but they gotta want it. It's my job to serve. I'm I'm serving the artist. I'm supporting them, but I'm supporting when when artists come into my office, when we sign them, what I say is I'm here to support your vision. Where do you want to go and how do I help you get there? You know, it's like the best managers are managers who manage great clients. And they prevent them from making mistakes, but they follow their lead. Because the best artists really know where they're going. They know it and they know they're good. And that's, by the way, you're building a business, you gotta do what you gotta do. My only advice about that was supporting artists, not supporting artists whose values you don't align with. You know, I kind of have a rule that I don't have to sign people whose values I don't align with when it's very obvious. It's often not so obvious. But, you know, um, people have committed violent acts against women or whatever, I'm not signing. I couldn't stand behind that. Yeah, because interesting that you mentioned that because most of these rappers that you see that are signed to labels, they all have like horrible backgrounds. They've been to jails. Like, so like, what do you have to say about that? It depends who they are and depends whether, depends the crime they've committed, depends the circumstances, and it depends on who they are as human beings. People make mistakes. People come from unfortunate situations. It's not up to me to judge unless they've done something that I think is, is that they, they have to be, I believe in redemption, I really do, because I can't take a walk in somebody else. I don't know how, you know, people grow up in all kinds of unfortunate situations. So I think redemption, I think people who realize that there's another path for them, it's okay. My name is Andres Vera. I'm a senior finance student and a lover of music. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions. One of them's quick. Um, so, the quick one: uh, What's your album of the year? Oh. And then more substantial: um, uh, As someone who uh, values creativity in music, as I'm sure you do as well, how do you forecast? Uh, AI will impact the music industry in the following years? That's, okay. SZA, SOS, love beyond. Okay. Um, how AI, I don't know. I think we're going to have to wait and see on it with AI. I don't know. I mean, what I hope, listen, I hope AI changes the world in terms of medicine. <laughs> and I, think, I hope, I wish people stopped thinking about it in terms of music. Um, and it'll <laughs> cure cancer and, you know, cure the ills of the world. I'm hoping that's where it goes. And I'm hoping that with music, it enhances music, that it, it helps give tools to make better music. But I don't know. I think we're going to see. Hi. Um, first and foremost, thank you for coming and taking your time for all of this. Uh, my name is Admir Bendo, and I'm actually an international student. I'm from uh, uh, Albania. And I remember that for years there was no universal, especially in the Balkans. It yeah. was more of something that you saw <laughs> on YouTube or on, on the internet. Um, but as years have progressed and I've, saw, I've seen the leadership and I've seen a lot of people taking, uh, talking about their, their journey with the C-suites, I wonder... Um, how have you changed as a leader once you got into this position? A lot of people ask about the journey, how you got here, but I think getting there and then staying there and actually being, creating that reputation for yourself or creating that time, time frame for yourself, it's what's actually harder, especially in this higher end position. So how would you say that your abilities or your traits have changed and molded during this time to for you to, to stay? It's so much easier being a chairman of a company <laughs> because you can rely on so many great people who work for you and you can tell other people to do things. It's like, hmm, you know, someone so called wants to do a deal. Oh, hey, Mark, will you just call them back and have them do that? You know, 
Hey, Tyler, can you? It's great. It's, I am such a good delegator. <laughs> I mean it. I, it's really what's changed is that I do not have to do this. I will fail if I, I mean, I grew up. And as I was working, it was like, I can do it. Oh, no. And give me that, give me that, another responsibility. Oh, I got that. And I'll get my kids to sleep. And then I'll call you back. And all of that, I, did, I had to do everything by myself. I thought that's how you do it. You don't succeed as a, as a CEO if you do it yourself. You succeed if you surround yourself with great people. And you learn how, and you're confident enough to delegate. So. I know we're just about out of time. Maybe uh, Jody will stay for maybe a couple of minutes if folks want to come up and, and, and chat with her. But on that note, the notion of you need great people who make these things happen. I just want to say on behalf of the College of Business Administration, this event couldn't have happened tonight without an amazing team of faculty and staff. The student clubs, Beta Gamma Sigma, Consult for America, and Tanner Bain Entertainment Business Society, the Lion Investing Society, and the Marketing Society, thank you all, your leadership and your membership, for being here. So we have a, we have a parting gift for uh, Jody. We'll give her lots of LMU and CBA swag. Um, this is our fall session of leadership from the C-suite. And I think based on the fact that you could sit here for another hour asking her questions, you enjoyed hearing from the C-suite. In the spring semester, we'll be welcoming Larry Freeman, the co-president of LAFC Soccer, to also talk about his journey and his career. Um, but for now, please join me again in thanking Jody Gerson from University of Music Publishing.